today podcast is a talk with priyanka desiraju a biomedical engineer working in clinical research at the cincinnati children's hospital medical center popularly known as children's she has a masters in biomedical engineering from the famous johns hopkins university and johns hopkins school of medicine she has been a stem mentor for numerous organizations around the globe since 2008 and was nominated to the forbes 30 under 30 achievers list in 2020 in the category of education she received the leader of impact award from the entrepreneurs of success organization in 2021 and was also nominated to the forbes culture 50 champions list for her stem monitoring and all the efforts in the year 2022 she received the generation now award from the empower gen now network in cincinnati she is the president of the young professionals group at cincinnati children's and mentors a number of high school students in the cincinnati region she is a member of the advisory team part of the cincinnati children's division of leadership development and is a board of directors of the cincinnati children's credit union priyanka is also an autocross car racer for the sports car club of america and has won the cincinnati regional championship trophy for three consecutive years this is in addition to all her work in stem and motivating young children She enjoys traveling around the world, cooking, reading, swimming, cycling, and best of all, Indian classical music. Friends, I am now going to have a dialogue with Priyanka Desiraj. Uh, welcome to my show, Priyanka. Great to have you with us. Happy to be here. Uh, the young girls that we work with, who are uh, doing their uh, engineering and studying other courses always wondered about the uh, wonder women and i think you fit that role very well so one of the questions is with your experiences as a woman in stem <clears throat> so i think starting off um the reason why i can be a stem mentor is because i have been through the journey of stem myself STEM for everyone is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, because I was a STEM person myself, my simple motto in life, in order to be able to encourage more women in STEM, is if I can do it, you can do it. It's as simple as that. And by continuing my STEM journey in STEM right from school to undergrad to graduate school, and now even working in a STEM field. I feel like I'm able to be a STEM mentor just because I've been in the journey myself. And my point is to get more women involved in STEM. As you probably already know, um, the numbers in terms of uh, gender differences in the STEM field is, is very, very um, different. It's uh, there's a big gap in between the number of men in STEM and the number of women in STEM. My small goal is to be able to kind of bridge that gap a little bit. Excellent. What would you say about mentorship and volunteer activities? So I always tell my students that in in order for you to be able to fully learn more about what exactly you're doing, practice in terms of helping others is always the best way to do it. Uh, the more you are able to um, show it as an example what you are to others. the more you are able to better be more confident in everything that you do so in terms of mentorship i think um, i started mentoring since 2008 and uh, with every class of students that i had it's been mentoring in very different ways so it's either been helping out with college applications it's been um, helping out with figuring out what the person wants to do you know we are lucky to have all of these opportunities given to us but there are so many people around here who don't know enough to know what they want to apply to so being able to help there is is an important thing so my advice is if you are a person who can help someone else 
definitely do that because there are many people who might not even know of opportunities like we do. In terms of voluntary activities, all of my mentorship activities since 2008 have all have been voluntary. Um, it's just my time that I like to spend helping people. Um, it's a great way of, you know, spending your time. And um, I would definitely encourage people to continue volunteering in these activities so that they get a feel of exactly what's happening and how they can better help people who, you know, don't have resources that we do. I, I like the uh, sense of volunteering. Is there, is there some way that we can motivate them to volunteer? Absolutely. Because the government is to come and ask, uh, uh, can we do something for the trust? Yeah. So we've been trying to tell them teach English to that, but I think some other mantra is required. So I think when it comes to mentoring, it depends on what type of mentoring you want. A lot of people, I think, if we have an option in the trust where it says mentoring for this activity, so it, it could be as simple as reading a book to someone. Um, for example, people who are blind, who cannot see, uh, and who are in the process of still learning Braille, what if we have an, a group within within the trust, within the mentoring, that primarily helps read to people? So by specifying exactly what they can be volunteering towards, building. by saying volunteering in general, people might not be sure what exactly that they're getting into, but having different categories like volunteering for, you know, to read or volunteering for STEM activities. It could be as simple as if a college student is ready to volunteer, he or she can take another student with them to college so that they can just shadow them. For a kid who doesn't have these resources, shadowing or being with someone who is in a STEM field can be a great, um, you know, um, example for them to be able to realize what's happening in that field. So I think to be able to get more people into volunteering, be very specific as to what exactly they're doing. And by putting it out there, I'm sure you'll get a ton of people with specific interest and they can join that group. Excellent suggestion. I think that should be taken up because we will specify what areas that we require. The next question is, what has your journey been so far? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think my STEM journey has been of its own story for a long time. It's, I've done my bachelor's in biotechnology engineering. I decided to do a master's in biomedical engineering. And then I now work at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital where I do clinical research. So the STEM journey has taken a course of its own. Just because very early on I realized STEM is something that I really want to do. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky and, you know, grateful to have this verified education. I, I feel like because I had it and I know others don't, my responsibility almost is to be able to help them get that. So my journey in STEM has been very consistent in biomedical research. Um, and that's what I continue to do. <clears throat> but on, you know, during the journey and during all these times, I feel like I've acquired different interests which I pursued. And I think, again, an advice to the younger, you know, generation listening to this podcast is explore things that you're interested in, not with a, you shouldn't expect that everything will work, but you should definitely give it a shot. Um, you know, there are so many opportunities that come our way and there are so many that we can find ourselves. We have to put ourselves out there and we need to find these opportunities for ourselves. If we get them, we should be lucky that we are getting them. But otherwise, I feel even till date with everything that I do, I always try to look for more opportunities to see where else can I help? Where else can I be able to, you know, put my efforts towards? So I think my journey has been such where over the course of years, I've acquired more things. And I've acquired interests that even I didn't know would be interesting to me. And just to be able to, you know, um, be in a, in a zone that's not your comfort zone. See how it is. And then you decide whether you want to do it or not. So I continue to apply that even till date, looking for opportunities. Because, because I think every opportunity is learning something new. And to me, that's the most exciting. I like the word comfort zone. And I think we have to now move from that. Uh, about your leader of impact award, would you like to share something on that? Sure. So <clears throat> it started off, all of this started off when I'm, in 2020, I was nominated to the Forbes Under 30 Achievers list. 
And that came all of a sudden, uh, not expecting that at all. I did not make it to the under 30 list, but the nomination I think spurred a lot of these additional STEM activities. Another reason why I say we need to put ourselves out there is you don't know when one opportunity will lead to another. This is exa exactly how Leader of Impact happened. Um, <clears throat> the Forbes list came out, the nominations came out, a lot of interviews happened, and I was able to help more people in STEM just by virtue of talking like this or giving an interview. So when an opportunity again, I stress on that so much is because you never know what it will lead to. So the Leader of Impact Award was basically how much a person is being able to impact his or her community. And I think I was selected and got that award primarily because of that. Because my work is not only in the Cincinnati, Ohio region, it's in the United States and it's across the world. Because a lot of my students are from different parts of the world. And I was asked on how my what my reach is and how exactly my work is impacting others. So the leader of impact was a was a big jolt of energy for me when I got it because it's validating in a way that you know you're being recognized for something, you know, you didn't necessarily go into knowing that you want an award out of it. That's the key though. You do what you have to do with everything that you got because you're passionate about it, because you like it. Awards come and go. And those yes are boost, you know, boosting to your energy and, and just your enthusiasm. But the the reason why you're doing what you do should not be an award. If it is, it's a bonus. Uh, what a humble uh, sentiment. Now moving away from STEM, uh, this autocross mm. uh, thing. Tell us something about it. Very really exciting stuff. It's as exciting as it sounds. And <clears throat> uh, I got into it in 2020. Again, the pandemic has proven to be a playground of you know new interests and activities. I'm sure for everyone, this was one of those. So a family friend of mine in Ohio has been racing now for 40 years. To put it very briefly, an autocross star racing competition is basically um, you drive your own car. That's the nice thing about it. Um, you don't need to do any modifications to your car. Um, every um, tournament and parking lot is set up in a way that there's a track, a track that's filled with cones. So the easy goal is to be able to get to the get through the entire track without knocking off a cone. And now it's unlike NASCAR and F1 racing, which I know a lot of people think when you think sports car racing, even my father, who each time, you know, when I call him and say I have a race next day, he says, oh no. So uh, it's not what you think it is. At the time, there are about three cars on the track. So a typical day would be I get there in the morning and I walk the track. The more you walk it, the more you kind of learn it so that when you're in the car, you know exactly when to make the turns and how. So it's not a straight track, it's a curved track with very, very sharp turns. So your speed is actually not more than 80 miles an hour, but the way you do it is actually comes down to some sort of skill. And that's the exciting part. And that's what I'm trying to tell people to again say, if I can do it, you can do it. Primarily because I learned how to drive only in 2017. And I started racing in 2021. I never learned how to drive in India. I learned that I was very, you know, I was very driving nervous. But this was something else. So like I was saying, so you're in the car and then your foot on the accelerator is either completely on or not. There's no mid ground. That makes it exhilarating is, is the word to use. You wear a helmet throughout because just in case, you know, things don't go according to plan. And then you're making these turns in a way that your car, you're, you're basically, you're controlling your car. So much so that it's actually slipping out of your hand and you're getting into that. Wow. It's exciting also because all of these skills can be applied to your day-to-day -day driving. You're driving the same car, remember? So... God forbid in a highway, you know, something happens, I have the ability not to be able to flip out and to actually be able to control the car. And the track is about a mile, so you get through it, and if you do knock off a cone, then you add two seconds to your time. So the whole point is to get as little time as possible. You run about six times like this, and you choose the best time. So in a year, there are about eight tournaments. If you win, like if you place number one in five, then you get the championship trophy at the end of the year. 
very interestingly for someone who has barely any driving experience, I ended up winning the championship trophy 2020, 2021 and 2022. Wow! So, autocross racing is fun. Another part of my efforts is eventually to be able to give a TED talk. That's my goal. Um, I've attended and I've been invited to attend the TED conference, but I want to be able to be a TED speaker just to reach out to those women who think or who are who are in this world where, you know, the notion is that women drivers are bad drivers. That's a myth that needs to go. If I myself as a woman of color, to make it more clear, I'm able to do something like this in a male dominated field. I want to be able to inspire those who, you know, question themselves on a lot of things to say that it is possible. I'm doing it. Um, you know, in a, in my tournament, there are about 160 participants of which four are women. That's it. That number needs to change. So my efforts, be it in STEM or be it in autocross racing, is to change that number in my own way. Fantastic. And then the, uh, who's been very, who's been an influential woman? I get asked this a lot. I think the, the, most um, influential person, I would say, is um, my aunt, my mother's sister, who lives in St. Louis, Missouri. You know, whenever I ask this question, we always we always think of celebrities who have inspired us. We always think of famous people who, you know, we can say, oh, I mean, sure, am I inspired by Michelle Obama? Yes, very much. Do I follow her work? Yes, very much. But when you look back, it's the people closest to you that have the biggest impact. To me, it was my aunt because I've seen her hand in life. I think if I don't know how to do that, then there's no point in me doing all of these things. So seeing her hand in life in all its, you know, different ways has really been inspiring to me because it gives me the strength to see that every time and to be able to apply it in my own life as well. So I think she has been a very, very influential person. Um, another person who I you know, derive great inspiration from is another family friend of ours who is the leading neuroscientist in, in the country. And I've seen her, I've had the privilege to kind of, um, you know, see her through my college years and even now of how she handles being a STEM woman, you know, woman in, in, in STEM. And I've been able to learn a lot from her looking at her journey. Um, and just, I think, humility on all fronts is, I learned from them. And that's the, that's the main thing. These awards and everything is nice, but it boils down to how much you're able to help your community. And that's what I want to continue doing. And we've been seeing this lovely items that you cook and chef and put them out. Let's say a few words about that. Yeah, for sure. That also started in the pandemic, in 2020. Um, I had this um, fascination of cooking everything from scratch. So even, you know, croissants from scratch, the spring roll sheets from scratch, just because I wanted to know what that process is like. Um, that got me interested in cooking quite a bit, and so much so that I now view it as a scientific experiment. Uh, the more I do it, the more I can tweak things, the more I'm able to learn, and learn about, you know, food items themselves. Um, it's become a, it's become a huge passion. I ended up participating in an online, um, cooking competition that started off as an online thing during the pandemic. I just logged into it again, see, looking for an opportunity. I went to Google and I typed food competitions near me. And that's how I was able to find this. The Culinary Federation of the US had this competition where you submit your photos initially. So I, I take a lot of photos as I as I cook. So I submitted that thinking, oh well, let's see what happens. Passed that round, and then the second round was um, there was a judging panel, and it was five consecutive days of the week. They would tell you what to cook 24 hours before, and you need to be able to prep, and they give you one hour that day to cook and plate. It was. I've grown up seeing MasterChef and I know the kind of pressure that they put on, especially what we see on the TV. This is exactly like that. One hour to cook a dish that I've not cooked before, or I, I hadn't, and then to be able to plate it. And then they're constantly watching you and they, they, they try to put as much pressure as possible. It was a tough week. 
Um, but it, again, it was an opportunity that I wanted to give it a shot. I wanted to try. So when I won most promising chef, I was also surprised and you know my abilities to be able to do yeah. so. Did multi facet ability and to handle multiple things at the same time. They always say that Indian women are very apt and adapted. Another thing which I must share with you is that the photograph that you put out on old TV, I actually prepared a slide presentation for my school. Oh, right. Yeah, and I had 1982 uh, slides of my slides of these. I see. So I showed them both. I said, oh, bye. Yeah. Nice. That's and I think it's nice. absolutely fabulous photograph. So, friends, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time.